Megatrends and Mediating Art Disputes, part of the series Current Events and Conflict Resolution with Thomas G. Giglione. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast from NCMediations.com. It's where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Please remember, nothing contained in these episodes constitutes legal advice. So please talk to a lawyer as cases are fact dependent. Hi, I'm Mac Pierlui, attorney, mediator, and arbitrator working throughout Florida and Texas. And I am Natalia Owowska-Czajka, advocate, mediator, and arbitrator based in Warsaw, Poland. And I'm Thomas Giulioni, originally from Toronto, Canada, speaking to you from um, Vietnam. Natalia? Let's get started. But remember, this is just a piece of the series we are producing. And uh, remember, you can catch this discussion and past and future shows on our website, instantmediations.com, on the Lawyers and Mediators International YouTube channel, and on its podcast, all conveniently from the Instant Mediations app. So be sure to stay connected. All right. So we're back with Thomas. And this time, we're chatting about mediating art disputes. And this is a pretty interesting topic. It's more of a new topic dealing with um, some of the trends in the art world. Uh, Thomas, you've been mediating art disputes. So how did you get involved in it? Hi, Mac. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I've been involved with mediation uh, since 1999. So that's about 22 years as a court appointed mediator. And if you asked me in 1999 that I'd be mediating art disputes, I, I would, I would laugh um, because I, I, you know, I, I'm not originally an artist and uh, you know, uh, things, things have changed. And uh, so uh, I'm also an arbitrator and I got involved in cross border disputes. And uh, just recently I, I got involved with, um, mediating art disputes because of uh, the COVID crisis um, got me pushed into my old hobby of painting. So it was kind of uh, something that it wasn't planned and it was just something that came out of the, um, the, you know, the COVID situation where we were on lockdown and uh, I started painting again, uh, something that I hadn't done since my university years. All right. So you're also an artist yourself, right? And I wanted well, to screen share a little bit. <laughs> amateur, amateur. Oh. I'm an amateur. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's your passion of being an amateur artist that then led you to naturally flow into mediating art disputes? Yes. Um, so basically, you know, during the, the lockdown, um, I'm not a Netflix person and, and uh, I just wanted to get to know more about uh, Vietnamese art, Vietnamese culture, and got um, embedded into the art world. And I realized there were a lot of disputes uh, in the art community uh, just in Vietnam about provenance and um, and uh, authenticity. And uh, in fact, now artists are cutting a, a piece of their hair and they're embedding it in paintings just so their DNA would be in place um, to kind of... Um, verify the and validate the um the authenticity of the painting so um it's they would they say that um there's about one third of the uh the art that is that is up in galleries and museums are fakes hmm. so um, it's a huge problem and it creates a lot of disputes okay, so let me share my screen here because i got a little clip maybe 20 25 seconds um mm -hmm. showing you hard at mm -hmm. work in one of your art pieces mm -hmm. and uh, i think you can see my screen right we mm -hmm. do see your screen all this now, well any, now anyone who is uh, listening to this won't be able to watch it but they'll be able to we'll put the link to the video to mm -hmm. the clips um on the youtube channel okay great all right. so okay. here is one Yeah, so that's that's me um, with my mentor from the University of Fine Arts. Um, the first part of the painting, this is a Vietnamese style of painting, involves engraving, and then uh, it's all natural uh, lacquer 
from uh, trees and uh, using uh, duck shells and silver foil, gold foil. Um, it's a 100-year-old tradition. So I got involved in that um, as a hobby during the lockdown. Got it. So and, go ahead, Natalia. And then you say that you're mediating the art disputes. This is really mm -hmm. a very niche area, even when you are an artist yourself. And I don't think that many mediator or may, mediators may know much about how you can do such mediation and what kind of art disputes are, are really mediatable, what can be mediated in such a dispute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very broad range. Um, so, it, 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 you know, it, uh, disputes may arise uh, between artists, maybe uh, royalties, uh, maybe uh, an artist, uh, you know, passes on and the children, you know, we'd be claiming royalties, a museum um, over or in a gallery, um, uh, maybe um, someone buys a painting and discovers it's a fake. Um, there are many, uh, you know, auction houses. Um, there are, are even cases where embassies will get involved uh, because, uh, you know, they are national treasures. So um, it could be um, many number of different types of disputes that uh, could be involved in our mediation. So it's quite a, I've discovered it's quite a complex field. Okay. So what kind of organizations, if any, are can a mediator join or get involved with to help support them in this niche market? Yeah, um, there are quite a number of them I've discovered. Um, for example, the Milan Chamber of, Car uh, uh, Chamber of Arbitration uh, created ADR Arte, and uh, they, they started in 2015. I, I believe they um, mediated and arbitrated about several hundred disputes so far. Um, so um, there's other institutions like the Art Law Center of the University of Geneva, um, and uh, they created a platform called Arthemis. Um, there's also the Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands, um, the Arbitration Institute uh, joined forces with the Authentication and Art Institute in 2018 and they also uh, created uh, a court of arbitration for art and um, called CAFA. They do training uh, for arbitrators um, to get into this niche market um, and they also resolve the disputes. Uh, they also have MedArp, which is something that I'm a big fan of, Med Arbitrations. So, um, and um, the structure is a little bit different and uh, to be a mediator in those organizations, um, you might, you know, have some sort of background in, in historical art or something like that. So they're very specific as far as you know what what kind of mediators would be able to be involved in such a pool. So because they're quite specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Tell us, please, then, who participates in such a mediation? who can be the initiating party, who are the parties at all, and is it done within a pending court proceeding or outside of court? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Now I notice that, well, most of these art disputes are cross-border. And um, so a lot of these cases uh, have been litigated for many years, going back and forth. And now there's the Singapore Convention, uh, which is kind of a parallel to the New York Convention for Arbitration, and it allows for um, disputes that are mediated uh, cross-border uh, to, um, to be um, awarded in, uh, in cross-border disputes. So the Singapore Convention actually um, is a really good tool for cross-border disputes in, um, in mediating disputes. So basically it, it, it could involve um, it could involve domestic uh, disputes, but not not so common. Uh, most of them are cross border, and they usually involve uh, specialists who are curators, or they invite um, evidence 
um, and uh, in the pre-mediation, which can be a little bit more complex than the traditional mediation. And the Singapore Convention only allows commercial disputes. So it can't be about uh, anything outside uh, the commerciality of, of the dispute. Got it. So Singapore Convention was kind of the uh, earthquake, right, in the mediation world some years ago. And I never thought that it could apply so directly to art um, disputes when you know, cross-borderism you know, comes up. So how do you deal with cross-border issues yourself whenever you're dealing with some of these kind of cases? Yeah. Well, like like I said, I, I just recently um, got into um, this part of the um, mediation process, and um, I've been dealing with things um, kind of uh, in the preliminary stage, not um, in the litigation stage, and um, just via email negotiations over Zoom, and not in formal uh, negotiations. But um, if I wanted to, you know, I could go to, uh, you know, Amsterdam and get accredited for this specific kind of a mediation. But um, I'm more, uh, to, to tell you the truth, it, if somebody really wants to do, do well with traditional art, um, they would probably, have, it'd be better if they have background in art. Uh, I'm just an amateur and I don't have the, you know, the degree in art history and things like that. That's why I kind of, uh, I'm looking to more towards disputing, uh, disputes involving um, the future of art, which is, uh, you know, involves cryptocurrency, uh, NFTs, which is the new digital art form, because uh, I become an expert in that field and uh, I don't need a, an art history degree. Uh, to be to mediate those kind of disputes. Yeah. Um, be, we'll, go ahead, Natalia. Thank you so much. And uh, being in this business, you already can notice some trends in mediating our disputes. Can you expand on that, please? Because that's actually very interesting. How it is going to develop? Uh, how do you think? What can influence this market? How mediators can get more involved? Um, mm -hmm. seeing it towards the future. Yes, um, I think technology is driving a lot of this. Um, Australia, uh, you know, for some reason, they're very much into protecting artists. Um, in any other country that I've noticed, they have um, specific laws for royalties where artists get royalties and um, ways that um, they can enforce these uh, royalties. So. Now technology is um, really changing everything where now we can use um, NFTs to um, validate and uh, you know, give auth uh, authenticity to, for the artist um, where they don't need all these other experts and history um, to, you know, you, you could quickly acquire provenance of an, uh, of an art piece uh, that's only two months old. Um, that could be could it be have been traded five times over. Um, so um, technology, I think, is the biggest driving force, and I think uh, there's a huge future uh, with NFTs, uh, non fungible tokens, uh, which has been very topical in the international um, art community right now. So I got a short little video clip um, mm -hmm. where you can kind of see. Um, this tech in action. Want to play mm -hmm. it and just get your feedback on mm -hmm. it, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, let's share the screen and let me know when you see it. We see right. your screen. Thank you so much. All right, so mm -hmm. this is only 16 seconds. Again, for those mm -hmm. who can't watch it, they'll be able to see it later online. So I mentioned earlier that uh, some artists uh, embed in their painting uh, a little strand of their hair um, in case there's ever a dispute to, to show um, their DNA. But in this case, you could see here, they embedded a NFC chip that um, actually links to the digital uh, art uh, of that piece. And uh, that piece is on the blockchain and the blockchain 
um, stores that data and blockchain is um, immutable, meaning it can never be changed. So here you have blockchain technology with IoT technology. You have um, a traditional art piece and uh, NFC chip that's embedded in there. So basically this, this kind of technology um, authenticates art, authenticates uh, the provenance who owned it um, at an infinitum. Um, so this is uh, really changing the way that um, art disputes can be resolved in the future. Well, and now, and cryptocurrency, um, there's also what's uh, cryptocurrency is also being driven by the, uh, the NFCs, uh, NFTs. Um, and now the physical world is integrated with the digital world. So um, because of cryptocurrency, because of NFTs. So we have a digital pathway to find the provenance of art. So I think it's a powerful tool um, to be used um, in resolving um, disputes. Um, and uh, also, uh, I mean, also, I'm also an arbitrator in cryptocurrency disputes, which, which is kind of related to the NFT market. So these are kinds of trends that I, I think that are, um, are being driven into the, the future uh, of art mediation. Gotcha. So, I mean, Thomas, do you see any other trends um, that you know you can envision in the future? I mean, I don't know. I'm talking about like two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. The sky's the limit on where things could go, right? Um, when you talk about technology, two years is like a hundred years. Uh, I could tell you something that's that exists today that didn't exist a month ago. Okay, that's revolutionary. Um, I talked to an artist friend in, in Toronto just last week, and her her husband is in NFTs, and he's a programmer, and uh, he works with a startup company that now puts NFTs within NFTs. You could have interest bearing NFTs, so the NFT could uh, could be locked, and then you could get money out of that later on. You could put a trust fund in there. Um, you could uh, put limited edition prints inside. So it's kind of like a, a Russian doll within, uh, you know, uh, I don't know the technical word for that Russian doll, but it's like NFT within NFT. And these are called uh, charged uh, NFTs, which uh, could, um, an artist could put an NFT and um, donate a portion of the art, could could give um, a percentage royalty to his children. And then, um, you know, when um, it could be locked and maybe when the artist passes, um, the the royalties are given to his family automatically, you know? Um, so there's, I'm talking about something that didn't exist a month ago that exists now uh, or is about to be launched. Um, so I think, I think um, you know, um, the technology, is just um, you know if you can imagine it, it could happen. Um, so um, I think it's it's just a a situation where I think there's a a lot of opportunity. Um, so in my sense, I'm mediating. I'm looking at an opportunity of mediating disputes in this new wave uh, where art is going, and um, and uh, these kinds this kind of technology. Um, I think. If you want to be into traditional mediation, then you should, you know, be involved with the art history and fine arts and things like that. But if you want, if you're very interested in this niche area, then I would recommend, you know, uh, learning about NFTs and cryptocurrencies because I think there's going to be a lot of disputes. It's um, it's already affecting the banking industry, and governments are scared of this technology and how it's going to affect the banking industry. So I could see a lot of uh, disputes involving banks and, um, you know, and uh, you know, um, hackers and 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 uh, you know, who's responsible? Insurance uh, play, would play a, a big role in these disputes. Um, so I think it's a it's an area that, it, it you know, if you're if you think if you're a young mediator, or you want to look at the future of mediation. I think that's where it's going. Thank you so much for all of that. 
and for all your thoughts. For those who are watching or listening, if you learned something today, be sure to follow and listen through instantmediations.com. We'll go ahead and we'll be progressing with uh, having Thomas J. Giuliani with us and sharing his interesting and insightful things for mediators and for, body, for anybody else who would like to listen. Please remember, again, Instant Mediations up is there for you, downloadable from both uh, Google platform and from Apple Play, and uh, just stay connected. Thank you so much. Thanks.